Now I'd like to welcome our neurosurgeon, Dr. Mitchell Hansen. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Hansen working in the Hunter in here today. He's one of the few neurosurgeons that work with Glyolin, which he'll talk more about today. So please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Hansen. And it's his operating day, so he's literally here in between surgeries. Good morning. Um, sorry about the technical issues. Um, as Sandy said, I'm Mitchell Hanson. I'm one of the neurosurgeons at John Hunter. And sorry for my attire, but I thought I'd warm up doing a brain tumour this morning before I came here. So um, it's a real honour to be invited along to speak to you today. Um, we don't often get the chance to talk... Well, I don't get the chance to talk to a lot of patients too often um, down the track and certainly their families. Um, I kind of meet you at the pointy end and most people actually forget meeting me to start with um, before you go and spend some time with, um, with people like James and the radiation oncologists and Sandy, our great team that's around. Um, it's always going to be hard to follow James if you know he's going to get up and talk to you about how to take drugs and then you're going to get a pretty boring topic by me. So thanks James for setting me up. That was good. Um, Sandy gave me a very... Um, wide range of things to talk about and um, so uh, I've kind of um, specified on a couple of things and um, most people don't get to meet their neurosurgeons or talk to them too much so I guess I can fill in a little bit about who we are and what we do. We're pretty normal people. Um, there's about 155 of us in Australia. Um, not all of us do brains but um, uh, I'm lucky enough to do a bit of both, so brains and spines, peripheral nerves. We, we're we probably the true general surgeons. Um, <clears throat> so a little, about, a little bit about me. I guess I'm a bit of a country boy. I grew up in Bathurst. Uh, it's a fairly small town. problem with neurosurgery is we need a whole bunch of um, very expensive equipment that they can't put in places all over the place. So Newcastle, I guess, is my new home uh, and has been for the last seven years. Um, I started university a long time ago, um, way back in 1990. Um, five degrees and 12 years later I kind of finished university, it was a pretty good time. Um, but I uh, didn't really want to leave, but probably should. Um, I was a baby doctor, not a paediatric doctor, but a baby doctor uh, in 2003 and 2004 in Orange. They don't do a lot of neurosurgery out there. Um, but uh, I was still pretty keen, and I've kind of been keen on it for a long while. Um, my neurosurgical training started at Royal Prince Alfred in 2005, and then um, that went on for six years, and then I did some extra training in Canada, in Toronto. And that's a pretty standard kind of procedure for neurosurgeons. We flog ourselves for a while in Australia and then go overseas for a while. Um, and then um, learn some new stuff and bring it back. So I think, you know, overall um, in the world, we're pretty well trained people. So you read about a lot of stuff in the US and the UK, they get time to publish. We don't spend too much time publishing, we just work. Um, anyway, I've been in Newcastle since 2012. And as I said, it's home now. Not that I'm a local, I haven't been here for 60 years. Um, <clears throat> now I work about 70 to 80 hours a week, give or take. Um, as I said, we're the true general surgeons. We do heads and brains and um, trauma and tumour as we're here today. We do degenerative stuff, we do spines, we do carpal tunnels, we, we do everything. Um, and yeah, I love my job. Uh, today, I'm not going to bore you for too long. They gave me a lot of time to talk, but anyway, we'll, we'll be here for a little while. Um, I'm just going to outline the role of surgery, so what I think about when I'm coming to brain tumours. Um, and really, we're going to talk about improving quality of life and changing your survival. I'll talk about the basic steps of surgery um, and what's involved. And probably a little bit on what you should think about when you're looking down the barrel of doing stuff. I'll talk a little bit about the new technologies in surgery. We haven't got as many cool, um, funky stuff to talk about as what James does, like THC and CBD and everything else, but you know, um, we've got a couple of things. 
I'll briefly talk about the role of recurrent surgery. Uh, and then we can talk, uh, you know, hopefully you'll have a whole bunch of questions for the panel and you can grill James about that later, which is good. Um, you know, what about Hunt and neurosurgery? I thought I'd outline what's involved in that. Um, where, as everybody knows, I show this picture overseas um, and when I go to, to give lectures overseas, you kind of say, well, okay, this is Australia because I don't know where the hunter is. And then we've got that red area is what we cover. So, um, but we've also got, uh, we've now got the North Coast as well. So basically up to the border, um, pretty much Kemp's is kind of the North border of what we uh, are on for. So I'm on call, I started on call yesterday and I'm on call until Monday. And so I'm on call for 49 hospitals for neurosurgery. So we take uh, a lot of calls and my registrars get flogged and hopefully they work well as a filter and don't call me about everything overnight. That said, I get called regularly. But I've got three-year-old twins at home so I get woken up at all times of the day anyway. Um, so the Hunter New England area, is it's, you know, if... Neurosurgical centres in Perth and Adelaide, they have a lot more space to look after, but, you know, we go pretty big. You know, Newcastle to Moree, so six and a half hour drive, or five hours if you're James and the way he drives. Um, you know, Bogabilla is uh, the other one, you know, 620 k's, and yeah, you put in the Amsterdam to Paris, this slide I uh, used for a European talk, and so that makes a little bit more sense to them, you know, from Amsterdam to Paris, we cover a lot more area than that. Surface areas and, and, um, and populations, the interesting one, we're basically the same size as England. Uh, there's 52 million, give or take. Um, it depends how many people are invading from Europe. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't have quite as many people, obviously, uh, to look after, but um, there's five neurosurgeons in Newcastle um, and we look after the population. Uh, we're actually the busiest public neurosurgical unit in the whole of Australia and New Zealand. So we get through quite a bit of work um, I like putting this and sticking it up the, uh, the other surgeons elsewhere because, um, you know, Royal Melbourne like to say how busy they are, but they've got 24 neurosurgeons on staff, whereas we've got five and we still get through more work than them. So obviously we work better than they do, but hey, just saying. <coughs> um, Newcastle's good. We've got the option for treatment in the public hospital or the private hospital. And really the difference uh, between the two is not much. Um, I've been doing neurosurgery, cranial neurosurgery in the private hospital for about five years. Um, but really the treatment you get in both the public or the, or the private is exactly the same. You know, we'll be involved in your surgery. Um, you get access to the um, cancer care nurses. You get access to um, the chemotherapists and the radiation oncologists and I think we all work very well and so it doesn't matter whether you're public or private you get treated the same and very well should I say. Um, <clears throat> you read a lot of literature or a lot of newspaper articles about the treatment that you can get in the big smoke. Um, we actually get through as I said more work than what they do at a lot of the other hospitals our outcomes, I think, are as good as any in Sydney or Melbourne uh, or overseas. And, um, you know, we don't need to go on about it and we don't um, pat ourselves on the back too much. But you can be safe in the knowledge that, you know, we're looking after you in, in the Hunter and we're looking after you well. Um, people like James um, are really up to date with their treatment after, the sur after surgery and treatment for your cancer. And, that's where most of the change is in your prognosis now. So you feel um, very safe in the knowledge that these guys are all looking after you. Um, I say there's no need to travel for the best treatment, but if you're in Bogabrilla, yeah, you're traveling. We're not going up there. <coughs> so I'll move on to the uh, less touchy-feely bits. Um, so what's the role of surgery? Um, so when you meet me, and I guess I'm the last person you want to meet in a hospital, um, uh, but there's two main reasons for surgery. 
So basically we need a diagnosis um, to know what's going on. Um, James doesn't like giving a whole bunch of stuff uh, without knowing what he's treating. I don't know why, but you know, hey, <laughs> everybody gets cannabis, so it's all good. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and really it's uh, for the treatment uh, and improvement of your symptoms and also your prognosis because depending on how much tumour you take can sometimes change um, what your prognosis is like. So diagnosis, um, this is a summary slide of all the different types of tumours that we can deal with. So as you can see it's meant to be a busy slide, there's an awful lot there um, and a lot of tumours look um, very similar on MRIs uh, as to what they do um, on, um, uh, yeah, they look very similar on MRIs and so until we get them under a microscope, uh, we don't know what we're dealing with and we stain them. And then also um, once they're under the microscope, then that changes the treatment uh, modalities afterwards, whether it's radiation, radiation and chemo, chemo or no treatment. <coughs> So I've got a lot of pretty pictures now because, you know, um, Sandy said I should put lots of pictures in. Um, so there's lots of different tumours here that I'll run through. So basically it's all going to be MRIs in the next little while and that's what I look at, funky kind of things. The nice thing about the brain when we're looking at it is we've got a left and a right side and they should look the same. When they look different, we know something's going on. Uh, when you've got something barn door obvious like this, it's pretty easy to see. Um, uh, not all tumours are nasty ones, some are benign, unfortunately this is a nasty one, so GBM um, can be, uh, can appear in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, it can be solid, so this is the bright white part which is a solid part of the tumour and then it can have a big cyst around it which is the darker part. So um, depending on what we're looking at is the way um, we can get a bit of an idea of what they are. But these things can also look like hemangioblastomas, hemangiopericytomas. Um, there's a number of different tumours they can be. So we need to take that out um, and, take, and put it under the microscope to find out what it is. Um, here's another tumour and this one's all solid pretty much. There's no big cystic part. Um, but the bright white is, this, you know, it doesn't look different to the other side. Uh, it looks different to the other side. So. Um, we know what we're dealing with and something this size is um, going to cause pressure on the adjacent structures and, and cause symptoms. Um, this tumour is a benign kind of tumour um, but it causes hearing loss and so the tumour is just sitting in here. Um, so it can cause hearing loss because here's the ear um, and so it sits on the hearing nerve but this is the brain stem and that's the clockworks of the brain. So the tumour here can put pressure on the brain stem and um, cause a whole bunch of symptoms, so it's better out than in. Here's another one with a little nodule, similar to the cystic one we saw, and this is a hemangioblastoma rather than a GBM. So, and a hemangioblastoma has a, um, we take this out and basically you're cured surgically. So we actually get um, to do some good sometimes. Um, this is a nasty, this is a GBM, um, tumours in the front um, and the, where this is in the brain um, causes a lot of mood changes. So patients that have changes in their mood and stuff um, present, well changes in their mood will uh, present with this tumour rather than weakness or something else in the head. Um, unfortunately we deal with adults and paediatrics and this is a paediatric type of tumour um, which is sitting in here, it's quite large. Um, so as I said we're general surgeons but we look after the adults and kids I think, um, not with tumours but the youngest patient I've operated on was a few hours old and the oldest one was 104 so yeah we get a true range of people to look after. Um, <coughs> let me go for time. So. I'm doing all right. Um, the fluid filled parts of the brain are in here. They're called the ventricles and the brain and the spine floats in something called CSF. It's like water. But if you go putting a dirty great tumour in the middle of it, it can block the passageway and so we can get an increase in size of the ventricles and that can cause patients to have problems. 
um, another tumour. Tumours in the pituitary gland that can get really big. Um, Tumours in the front meningioma. We take this one out. Patient's cured. It's quite good. Um, so I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. Anyway, that's enough of that. Um, any questions? I'll break it up a little. No, good. I'll move on. <laughs> Save your questions up for James. He's good. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, I just thought people would be sick of hearing me at the moment. Um, so the steps of surgery. So just to break it down a little bit, uh, number one, you get to meet the surgeon and the team. So uh, yeah, sure, I'm involved, but I've got a huge uh, number of people that are helping me look after you guys. Um, so uh, we have fellows which are trained neurosurgeons that um, finish their training and then want to do a bit of extra work. Um, and we have registrars, then they can be training registrars, so they're learning to be neurosurgeons. And then we have non-training registrars who are keen to get on to, um, to neurosurgery. Um, when I got on to neurosurgery, the seven people were in my year of training. So that's seven people in the whole of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so there's lots of people wanting to get on. I don't know why, but, um, but there are. So, and then there's nursing staff. So we've got clinical nurse consultants, um, we've got the general nursing staff that are looking after you in the world. Um, then when you come to theatre, there's always, uh, you know, the nursing staff there, the anaesthetists. So we've got a huge team in the background um, trying to look after you. So we get a number of investigations. Normally, um, most of the time people are presenting, they might have a, had a seizure to the emergency department. They might have had a change in their behaviour. They might have had headaches for a while. Um, and they'll often get sent for a CT scan or something and then brought into the emergency department. Um, your GP panics and sends you in and, uh, and then you get to meet us. And so we do a whole bunch of investigations. The MRIs that I showed you, that's probably the most important test that we get to work out um, best idea of what's going on. Um, an MRI is great at looking at soft tissue um, more than the skull and the light, which is what you do with a CT scan. Sometimes we'll get some other imaging, and this might be a CT scan of your chest, your tummy and your pelvis, and that's to look if there's cancer elsewhere in the body. Um, and PET scans, another scan that we can get um, to look at something if it looks like it might be high grade or low grade tumours. We'll then do something called stereotactic imaging. Um, stereotactic imaging is something that we do and we've got a computer that I can plug that into and then I can register on the head where we need to go. So this narrows down the hole that we need to put in and makes us find the right area because the brain's uh, apparently delicate in a few spots and we need to be careful about what we're taking out. Uh, you get a mission um, sometimes you'll go home and come back, depending on what we need to do. Um, you can be admitted to the ward. Um, we've got a, well, we've got a 16 bed um, neurosurgical ward. Uh, we normally have around 50 patients um, or up to 50 patients. We don't try and top and tail you, but, and we don't have any bunks, but we, you know, we make, make do with what we can. Um, and then we'll bring you in and then you'll undergo the surgery. Um, the post-op phase obviously follows that. Um, we, you, we tend to crack the whip. You don't get to lie around and wallow too much in bed. We get you up and about and moving because um, you don't want to spend that much time in, in hospital if you can avoid it. New technologies in surgery. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, James gets to play with most of the new toys. Um, uh, there's not lots of new technology in the last five years for, for neurosurgery and for, for treating brain cancer, but um, there's a few exciting things in the near future. There's a few lasers that are um, coming on board that can um, differentiate <coughs> brain tumour tissue as opposed to normal tissue, which can make uh, resection of tumours a bit quicker and safer. We can get some better guidance with... Um, with the navigation that we use. And 
um, we can have and better identify the tissue around uh, the tumours and also identify the tumours themselves better. And I'll talk about that with the glyoland in a sec. When I talk about better guidance, <coughs> there's a whole bunch of tracks in the brain. So, um, for example, for vision, so your eyes at the front, the visual cortex is actually at the back of the brain. So we have a lot of pathways that go through the brain and how they line up. So when we're looking at taking a tumour out, here, the big yellow thing, um, there can be tracks for the vision from front to back. Um, and if you look at the motor cortex, so the movement in your, your uh, body, and so we're cross-linked. So the right side will look after the left side movement. Um, we need to know where these pathways are, because if we just go in and take a tumour out, then we can affect the pathways and disrupt them and then cause, um, cause you to have uh, some deficit after the surgery. So we try and avoid that. Sometimes we can't, but these cortical mapping, we're getting better at looking th at this, and then that can help plan our surgery, because not all tumours are on the surface of the brain. We've got to go digging through them sometimes, and so we want to do that as safely as possible. Um, so glyoland. So I was talking about identifying tissue and um, what I'm talking about here is something called glioblastoma, GBM. Um, and sometimes because the cells that GBM have come from originate in the brain, um, there's not a, a big difference between GBM and the edges of GBM and normal brain. So we need to know where to stop um, and we also need to know um, that we've got as much as we can. We know that if uh, the more of GBM that you can take, uh, the better the prognosis if, um, with what's going on. So we need sometimes tools that can help. Um, for example, if you have melanoma in the brain, so melanoma metastasis, that's often black um, and has a big plane around it. So it's pretty easy to, to identify, but GBM on its own uh, it's a bit difficult. Um, so there's this drug called Glylan 5-ALA, um, and I've used it this morning actually in my the tumour I did. Um, and basically what it does is you take it as a small drink, it's a shot, so I can talk about shots, he's talking about doing um, weed and I get to talk about shots, you know, we're a fun kind of group of people. Um, but you take your 30 mil shot about five, five hours before surgery and then that gives it time to go through the body and then bind to the GBM cells. So um, I need to use a microscope to look at that. So basically it's, it's, um, we use a fluorescent light to do it and I hope nobody's squeamish because you're about to see some brain surgery. So this MRI has the appearance of GBM. So I look at this and 99 times out of 100, unfortunately this is going to be GBM. You can see the tumour here and the darker area around it is actually swelling around the tumour. So whoop, here's the squeamish bit. Um, so you're about to see a brain. So this is the dura being cut. So they're covering around the brain. We're cutting, or the prof's cutting that back. And you can see this line around it. And so that's the image guidance that we get given um, to see where the tumour is. So he's just dissecting around the brain. So he's um, stopped some bleeding there. And then now you can see the hot pink um, come in and that's the actual GBM cells. So it lights up and fluoresces. Um, and I find it very useful to find the edges of of where we're operating um, so that we can resect the tumour. It's kind of like neurosurgery for dummies, um, which is pretty helpful for me because I'm not real bright. <laughs> um, but as you can see, this is back to normal tissue and the hot pink is, is uh, the cancer cells um, and it really, it really does fluoresce as brightly as that. So it's actually a very useful adjunct to, um, to, the, um, to the rest of the tools that I've got to try and help take these tumours out safely. Uh, I might go back. Oh, 
We'll take the lump out. It suddenly goes for another 30 seconds. And so basically he's taking the tumour out that quickly. Um, you can go back and just get the last few remaining cells that are floating around. Um, and the surgery's gone quite neatly. So recurrent surgery, what's the role of recurrent surgery? So you've got a tumour, you've taken it out, and then unfortunately it recurs. So what's the role? The role, um, you know, I gave you two reasons why we do neurosurgery um, or for brain tumours, and that's a diagnosis. We generally don't need a, a diagnosis. The, um, the caveat to that, I guess, is lower grade tumours as opposed to the higher grade tumours. Sometimes when you get a recurrence with a low grade tumour, the tumour's differentiated and it's become high grade. So then I guess we are getting a change in the diagnosis. So, um, but the second role for that is um, to improve the quality of life. So if the tumour's expanded and putting pressure on the brain and you get some weakness, then sometimes we can take the tumour out and um, and reduce that pressure on the brain and hopefully improve symptoms. So who's it for? Well, it's not for everybody. Um, we're told to do no harm when we look at looking after patients and that's pretty important. Um, if I'm going to hurt you by doing surgery and I, I know that if I look at doing a surgery for a recurrent tumour and it's in a bad spot, um, and if I think the only real chance you have after that surgery is that you're not going to interact with people um, and I'm not going to offer you an operation. So it's not for everybody. And it's okay not to have further surgery, I think. And people sometimes think that their only option is to keep going and having more and more surgery and that's not always the case. And I think that's an important thing to have in the back of the head. So, conclusions. Not talking for too long, how good's that? Um, brain tumours can affect anyone. So, you know, adults, children, um, you might not have had any tumours in your family, you might not use a mobile phone incessantly. Um, brain tumours can affect anybody. Um, we need to treat these with respect. Um, uh, the brain's not an easy area to to work in sometimes. Um, you can do a great operation and people can still have a poor outcome. Um, so I always respect the tumour and I respect the brain um, and I respect the patient's wishes as to what they want done. New treatments are being released. As I said, um, cool funky stuff and all the trials James gets to do. Um, but there's a few things coming through with surgery, um, so that's helpful. And surgery remains a key component in the treatment of tumours. Um, but we're only, well, I said part of the problem, I should have written part of the solution. Um, you know, we can be a problem as well, I guess, but you know, hey. Um, but you know, we're only part of the solution. Um, there's so many other, um, there's so many other parts of your treatment, your journey with cancer. Um, and not all of it's medical, it's uh, the support you have at home, the support you have with your families and friends. Um, and you know, that's, uh, it's a journey you don't take on your own. So I think that's the most important thing to take away from today. And I'll shut up because James needs to answer some questions.